Welcome to the reInvent Nuclear Security Series and what is the last roundtable culminating uh, about three months of public facing work. I'm Peter Leiden, I'm the founder of reInventors and I'll tell you, I've been watching this uh, extraordinary series from the beginning. It really is the best of the series that we've done over the last several years here. Uh, and also, I have all expectations that the final roundtable here will be just as extraordinary and will live up to all those high standards. Now, when people, most people think about it, they think it's basically impossible or going to be very, very unlikely to get rid of nuclear weapons in their lifetime. Uh, they think, geez, you know, they can't even envision how that could even happen uh, in the space of the next several decades. And what we're going to do in this roundtable is we are going to explore five plausible ways to get rid of nuclear weapons within the next 30 years. We're going to be discussing five distinct scenarios of different ways to actually we could get there. And a scenario being a story of the future, but implicit in that story is a strategy of how we could get there. Now these scenarios have been developed by N Square, who's our partner in this series. And N Square is a new organization. It's backed by five of the largest peace and security funders in the world. It's the MacArthur Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Plowshares Fund, the Skoll Global Threats Fund, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Now, these scenarios, which you can read on our site, uh, the reinventors.net site, these scenarios are very visceral and really entertaining, and I highly encourage people to actually check that out. And so go, you can go to the reinventors.net website, right off the front page, we'll shuffle you right into the, the page where that's at. We also highly encourage people watching this live to actually make comments or ask questions. You can do that in the live environment in reinventors. You can do that in the Google Plus environment in our event page if you're watching there. And if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag reinventors. And we'll be, we have people watching all those three environments and they'll circle it the right, uh, any relevant comments will possibly move into the conversation here. We certainly will use it in our package of videos and write-ups that are going to come at the end of the week's time. Uh, but for now, what I'm going to basically do is turn this over to our very capable host of this series, Erica Gregory, who's also the executive director of N Square. So, Erica, take over. Uh, well, thanks, Pete. Uh, I am excited to be here uh, in the sixth episode. And uh, I just want to take a second to think a little bit about where we started and where we are today. Um, we began this whole uh, series uh, saying that we needed to explore a dilemma. Uh, and the dilemma is something like this. If, if we are to ultimately be safe from the threat of nuclear weapons, we would have to dismantle them. We would have to get rid of them entirely. But in the meantime, we have to put resources into safety and security of our existing arsenals. In other words, we don't get to choose between those two courses of action. And at N Square, our job is to look for ways to innovate and to attract new partners to looking at that dilemma and coming up with new ideas for keeping us safe from nuclear threat. So we've done that in the previous five episodes. We've looked a lot in particular at safety and security in the present. We've done that by looking at emerging technologies and how they might be helpful to us. And we've looked at how to attract next generation innovators to this field or new partners potentially from the private sector and from elsewhere. Uh, we've also looked at new media channels and how we might use those to reach audiences that we would never otherwise reach. But we're left at the uh, last episode thinking about what is the reason for doing any of this? What is the superordinate goal? What is the future that we want? And to kick us off, I'm going to ask Philip Yun, who's the Chief Operating Officer for the Plowshares Fund, to reflect a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish here. So, Philip. Thanks, Erica. So, um, thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here. I thought about setting, what Eric asked me to do is set some context um, and to think about what we're trying to do here, which is eventually eliminate all nuclear weapons, 16,000 of them that approximately exist right now in the world. And so what I thought was to talk about that particular goal in the context of this scenario. The first thing that, I have four observations that I thought might be helpful. One is that this is simply not a numbers game here of getting rid of 16,000 nuclear weapons. Um, it's, it's something that is, uh, and it's not about getting these countries to agree to that necessarily. Um, this is a long-term problem. It's going to take a very long time, and people have to understand that the world is going to be very, very different, um, uh, 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 very different um, if we are to actually uh, succeed in eliminating these weapons. 
The second observation is that I want people to understand that we're not talking here about this goal as being a Pollyannish fantasy whatsoever. Um, the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons has gone very much mainstream. And we've got serious states people, former Secretary of Defense William Perry, former Senator Sam Nunn, Secretaries of State George Shultz, and Henry Kissinger, who now agree to this particular goal. And so what we're not talking about here is a utopian fantasy. We have to understand that this future could either be much better than what it is now or not as good. So that's something we have to think about. I also thought about any precondition for these scenarios, uh, about preconditions for any of the scenarios that we're, we're thinking about here. And it struck me there are basically three things that we have to go about dealing with before we can get to eventually zero. One is this notion or this firmly held belief that nuclear weapons are the ultimate weapon and that we have to have them. We see movies that say we have to keep these nuclear weapons to get rid of asteroids, Godzilla, something like that. The second thing is the notion that it's okay for good guys to have them and not bad guys to have them, and we've seen those in movies as well. And finally, this is a little more wonkish and policy oriented, it's the notion that nuclear weapons um, are, are, that are that nuclear weapons are part of deterrence only, and that deterrence is not something that can be done by conventional weapons, and we know that's wrong. Uh, the last observation is I want to underscore what uh, Peter talked about earlier. Everyone I talk about say they agree that we should have less nuclear weapons or maybe even get rid of them. But they say it's just basically impossible and there's no point to talking about it. Well, you know, I'm here in San Francisco, I'm a Giants fan, and I think if the uh, Giants can win three World Series in, in, in five years, nothing's impossible. It's just really, really hard. And so part of making things hard is that it's hard for us to really imagine and use creativity as to what it might look like. And I think this is what I'm very excited about this particular series is because it's going to allow us to imagine what this might be like and to realize that, again, it's not impossible. It's just going to be really hard. And so let me stop it there. Okay, so I'm going to build on this a little bit, Philip. And uh, you mentioned scenarios here, and you talked about creativity. And I just wanted to step back a little bit and, and ask what are scenarios? What is this methodology that we're using here? Um, so I think the best way to look at this is that scenarios are a tool for strategic thinking and for planning that acknowledge that the future is inherently uncertain. We can't predict what the future is going to be. But what we can do is be prepared for a range of different plausible outcomes. Uh, so we can think ahead about how the future might unfold, and we can look at how we might manage in different circumstances. So scenarios that we're looking at here today, scenarios are research-informed. Each scenario in the set that you're going to be looking at here today needs to pass the test of plausibility. Right? That's really important. But it's also important that taken together as a set, the scenarios need to explore all of the most important, the most critical dynamics surrounding this issue of how to get to a world free from nuclear weapons. Now, we know that the actual future, the year 2045, will probably have elements of each of the scenarios we're going to look at here today. It's not about picking a winner necessarily. Um, and it's also true that there are many other scenarios that we could have explored, and I hope that people watching this episode will send us those scenarios. You're going to have ideas. Send them to us via the website at reinventors, uh, and certainly you can track us down at N Square on the web as well. Uh, but to get us started on this section here, I'm going to go to the author of the five scenarios, which again you can find on the reinventors uh, network website if you're watching along now, uh, but I'm going to turn to Jame Casho, who is the author of these five, and he's going to give us a sense of how they hang together as a set. Hi, folks. I'll do a, a, a quick overview of the, of the scenarios, and then we do our introductions. Um, the five scenarios are predicated on the idea that you know, we are in 2045, we have successfully eliminated nuclear weapons. Okay, well, how did we get there? And so on the basis of, of a variety of, of workshops and conversations with specialists and my own research, I created five different stories of how that future might happen. You know, and as Erica suggested, these are 
uh, not meant as predictions. They're not telling you what will happen. I like to think of scenarios almost like, like vaccinations. They help to sensitize us to possibilities so that if we encounter something that's, that seems to be indicating that we're heading in that direction, we recognize it and we, we're prepared. The five scenarios, the first is uh, the use or near use scenario, which we're calling the Jammu disaster, which takes place in a world where there has been a, an apparently accidental explosion in, in uh, northwest India and the repercussions and fallout from that, uh, figurative fallout from that. The second is what we're calling, reper uh, it's the repurposed institution scenario that we're calling emergency management. And here it's based on the idea that we can um, you repurpose the institutions created for you for, in this case, responding to, to climate change in a way that allows us to effectively work against nuclear weapons, work for the elimination of nuclear weapons. The third, uh, dominance of non-nuclear risks, is another climate change-based scenario. We're calling this bigger problems. And here, the resources and attention required to deal with fa fairly extensive problematic res results from climate disruption end up making it necessary for us to basically take our attention away from nuclear weapons and get rid of them. The fourth is the replacement and obsolescence scenario. Uh, we're calling sticks and stones for reasons that will become clear as you look into the scenario, which basically says that in a future where we can develop uh, weapon systems that are both in many ways more powerful than, but less um, incidentally harmful than nuclear weapons, basically gives us an alternative and nuclear weapons go away. The last diplomatic fade, uh, we're calling virtual zero, is one where essentially just patience pays off. Um, but we'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail shortly. That's great. And to help us do that, we have a really extraordinary group of people here today. And I want to thank you all in advance for being with us. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody to do some introductions. We will finish with the person who's going to lead us through the first scenario, his reflections about the first scenario. Um, so let me start with Beatrice, then we'll go to David, and uh, we'd love to hear who you are, what you think you bring to these conversations, and we'll come back around and end with an introduction to Eric Schlosser. Beatrice. Yeah, hi, and hi everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, my name is Beatrice Finn. I'm the executive director of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Uh, ICANN consists of 425 NGOs spread out from over 90 countries right now. And it's a big campaign that works to, to ban nuclear weapons. We want to see a treaty banning nuclear weapons negotiated soon. Um, and sort of my contribution here is really to bring sort of a, maybe more of a campaigner perspective on these issues. Um, we focus a lot on uh, international processes and, and how to develop new norms in the international community. So we'll bring in that together with sort of ICANN's ruthless positive attitude to this. So I was listening to Phil saying how hard this is going to be to eliminate nuclear weapons, and we sort of, nah, could also be quite easy actually. So I look forward to, to talking more about that later. Great, David. Oops, we need you to unmute. Oops, David, can you unmute there? Yeah, I, I had to unmute in two places, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is David Brin. I'm an astrophysicist and science fiction author. I do some consult defense-style consulting, but I'm also somewhat critical. Um, and my job is to do what Jame does, and that is um, create scenarios about the future, um, only in mine. Um, the characters get to have sex um, on the pages of a book, um, whereas Jaime is is more limited. Um, the the uh, situation is one in which my blog is called Contrary Brin, and I earn that because I believe this civilization is worth defending because it's the only one that puts up with people who are inherently contrary, as Jaime and I are. So when I'm a, around a bunch of, um, you know, Edward Teller type hawks, I probably sound like Beatrice. But if I'm around a lot of people like Philip and Beatrice, you're going to hear me speak up for Edward Teller because we are all here 
because of St. Bob. Now that's going to really incense some of you, but if we get rid of nuclear weapons, we have to replace the miracle that they brought, and that is 70 years without a general war. Um, so, and I think it can be done. Believe me, I do not think that uh, it's a good, stable, long-term solution. But it is something that we should bear in mind the the aspect that it, the benefits we got from them need to be replaced with something imaginative and effective. Um, and that's me being contrary. I love it. That is exactly why we asked you all to be here. We want to hear all of the different perspectives here, and I think um, you can you can take the gloves off. It's okay. Uh, so let's come around. We've heard from Philip. We've heard from Jamea a little bit. Let's go to Rachel Pike, and then we'll go to Tyler, and then we'll come back to Eric. Hi, Erica. Thanks for having me this morning. Appreciate it, and thanks for hosting this great series. Um, so let's see, two perspectives that I bring. I spent four years in venture capital investing in big ideas, and you'll see that the scenario that I'm presenting is about innovating our way sort of both out of and back into something similar to what we're in today. Um, and we invested in lots of big ideas, including every single one of Elon Musk's ideas. So we're sort of familiar with that kind of thinking. And I'm now sitting in a startup that I work for, which is in healthcare, but it's the same type of thinking about how do we innovate ourselves out of huge problems and big dilemmas um, and thinking about the consequences of those things. And then lastly, I'm sitting here because my grandmother started Plowshares, one of the co-hosts of this. Um, so I've also grown up thinking about the world of nuclear weapons and, and how to get rid of that. That's great. Thank you, Rachel. And Tyler. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you all. I'm logging in here from Toronto. Um, my name is Tyler Wiggs Stevenson. I chair the Global Task Force on Nuclear Weapons for the World Evangelical Alliance, which is the global body representing evangelical Christianity. We um, offer a global platform for a little over 600 million Christians across 129 uh, nationally constituted alliances. Uh, before this, I started an organization called the Two Futures Project, which was trying to bridge uh, the divide between uh, faith and anti-nuclear activism. Um, and I've been in uh, nuclear politics and nuclear advocacy uh, literally since the day I left college, um, which uh, to date myself is uh, now a little over a decade and a half. Um, so I, I come at this as a theologian and an ethicist and a pastor uh, as my primary vocation and training. Um, but where that bridges into concerns that are non-credal uh, and boundaries um, is in, you know, how do policies land with everyday populations? Um, how do people conceive of this? What are the global norms that govern uh, nuclear weapons? And it's primarily through that lens that I was investigating these really, really marvelous scenarios by Jemay. So thanks for having me. Well, thank I you. I should also I say I, I'm really glad that all of us got the memo about hairlessness, <laughs> and you can see the effects that thinking about nuclear weapons has on at least uh, some part of the population. So that's um, really a, a good message for younger people not to get into this field. I was, uh, I was thinking about whether it was politically correct to say anything about that or not, so thank you, Tyler, for mentioning it. Um, so I want to now hand this over to really kick us off talking about the scenarios to the person who, whether he knows it or not, uh, probably taught me as much as uh, anybody else about nuclear weapons when I came into this field, which is really less than a year ago, as somebody who's uh, meant to help help bring new people to the field, um, I there was uh, it was like a, a, a master's course reading a book called Command and Control, and we're really lucky to have with us Eric Schlosser, who's going to start out by talking about the Jammu disaster. Thank you, and um, I'm going to just tell a little bit about my background and, and how I came to this subject. I'm a writer. But academically, um, my background is history. So I really, I, I feel it's very important in contemplating the future to see how all of these trends have their origins to the past. Uh, the book that I wrote, Command and Control, was about the effort by the United States to control its nuclear weapons from the very beginning of the atomic era. And by control, I mean to make sure they can't be stolen, to make sure they won't detonate by accident, to make sure that someone within our own chain of command couldn't use one without proper authorization. 
And what I found is that again and again we came close to having accidental detonations in the United States that could have destroyed American cities or, you know, literally large portions of American states. So I agree with the comment that nuclear weapons have played a major role in preserving the peace for 70 years, and yet that has come with a phenomenal risk, and the story isn't over yet. And if a week from now there's a nuclear exchange, then maybe it was a bad idea to rely on them for deterrence. Uh, I spent six years on that book, and I spent most of last year looking at nuclear security, looking at the threat of nuclear terrorism. And I found that to be quite disturbing as well. I told the story of a break-in at one of our most high-security nuclear sites uh, in which one of the ringleaders was an 82-year-old nun. And if that group had been uh, a well-trained group of terrorists and not a handful of Catholic pacifists, there could have been catastrophic consequences as a result. Now, having spent seven years immersed in this field, I do not feel apocalyptic. I don't think we're doomed. But I do think it's urgent that we take action because the threat is real, and I think the threat is imminent. The scenario I've been asked to talk about is the accidental detonation of a nuclear weapon in India. Unfortunately, that's a highly plausible scenario. Uh, it's not probable, but if it were to happen tomorrow afternoon at 3, I think a lot of people would not be surprised by its happening. I think the only thing that I would change about the scenario is that it's most likely to occur not out of the blue, but during a moment of heightened tension between India and Pakistan. That's when the weapons are most likely to be fully assembled. That's when they're going to be on alert. And that's when a simple mistake, a human error, a technological glitch um, could lead to one of these detonations. And what would be extremely dangerous about that is initially there might be no idea what the cause of that detonation was, whether it was as a result of hostile forces, whether it was an accident, and that could lead to a much larger nuclear exchange. I do believe that if there is a nuclear detonation anywhere in the world that destroys a major city, it is going to have profound consequences and very well may encourage the abolition of nuclear weapons. It's good to remember that after the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in the United States, public opinion was overwhelmingly in favor of getting rid of nuclear weapons. Uh, not only that, there was an opinion poll that showed 54% of the American people wanted the United Nations to have a world government that controlled the existing nuclear weapons with the aim of eliminating them all. So sadly, I think this first scenario is quite plausible. I think it is how we might move quickly towards abolition, but I hope it never happens, and I hope we find a way to get out of this dilemma without tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people having to perish. So, Eric, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and these are, I'm going to start with you, um, uh, but I uh, would invite anybody else to jump in, and it occurs to me, Rachel, you might have some thoughts about this as well, and David, uh, but one of the key uh, dynamics in this scenario is uh, whether we think it's plausible or not that this kind of a disaster could happen virtually accidentally and without uh, being in a period of heightened tensions. This scenario is really about what happens afterwards, which is that we have mass documentation of an event in a way that would never have been possible, let's say, at the end of the 20th century. Um, because everybody has wearable technology, because there are sensors everywhere, uh, because people have drones, they're even printing, 3D, using 3D printers to print their own drones. So the, the event itself is documented in a way that is unprecedented in human history. And really what this scenario begins to talk about is it's, it's that bottoms up push that leads to change. What do, you, what do you think about that? Is that plausible in your view, Eric? I think it is, and yet I think it isn't necessary. It's remarkable how in the age of the newsreel, 
uh, when people read newspapers and relied on books, that you had exactly the same sort of groundswell worldwide in 1945 and 1946. Uh, we're, we're coming upon the 70th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and if you look back at the period right after the destruction of those cities, there was worldwide revulsion and a worldwide desire to get rid of nuclear weapons, and what intervened was the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. It's remarkable that even Bertrand Russell, uh, one of the world's greatest pacifists, was willing to argue that if the Soviet Union wanted to get nuclear weapons, they should be destroyed by nuclear weapons just to ensure that there would never be a nuclear exchange in the future. So I agree that the rise of social media and all of this technology would bring the disaster into people's homes in a way that's never been seen before, but just the destruction of a nuclear weapon, uh, just the destruction of a city by a nuclear weapon, even with more rudimentary uh, media, would have a profound effect. It would change everything. Uh, you look at what happened, I was in New York City on 9-11, and that was horrible when a few thousand people died. Uh, the change in civil liberties in the United States, the rise of uh, surveillance, if you were to lose a major city anywhere in the world, uh, it would threaten civil societies throughout the world. So I think, I think unfortunately, it's quite a plausible scenario. So a, a couple of folks here I know want to jump into the conversation. So let's go to Jamey. Let's go to, after Jamey, Tyler. And David, I want to make sure to circle back to you if you have anything you want to add here, too. So David, Tyler, Beatrice, and then uh, anyone else? So this very quickly, uh, two points. The, the first is that the reason that I didn't have in, in this scenario this take place in the midst of a very uh, tense time you know, between India and Pakistan is because it's, the goal was to try to come up with a scenario that didn't escalate out of control. You know, the, the, the goal was to try to come up with a scenario in which this could lead to rethinking action. And unfortunately, as you as you suggest, there's a you know there's a very high likelihood that this kind of situation could have um, unprecedented and extremely <laughs> unfortunate results. Uh, the second is with, with regards to the documentation. I think what's in, one thing that's really interesting here, and I made a real point of this, is that it's um, not just detailed; it's relentless. This is something where you don't just have uh, news cameras and, and the military controlling access to the site. You have literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of people independently documenting this in a way that just doesn't go away, in a way that can't be controlled. And I think it's that kind of uncontrolled proliferation, if you will, of information that really becomes a key driver of changing people's opinions. Yeah, I um, may I the may I uh, may I cut in here? Um, yeah, please. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not hearing you. Um, yeah, yeah I, I I agree with. Uh, I think the last three speakers, Erica, was very very wise to raise the notion that the world population is getting ready to be what we've always dreamed of and that is world citizens and this is something that is going to be extended as I talk about in my book The Transparent Society um, it's, it's going to be extended by the technological powers um, many of the um, major non-democratic states think they now have the internet sussed they think they now can use it as an instrument of control um, and that's going to all go away as soon as Google and Facebook and all these other companies put up hundreds of satellites overhead in which that are going to pass over China and places like that all the time. Um, I think that uh, what Eric raised is the danger of inadvertent war and partly we escaped inadvertent war partly due to science fiction because you had mythologies like failsafe that criticized one style of possible way that we might get inadvertent war and the Air Force immediately spent millions to eliminate that one. Uh, Dr. Strangelove, uh, what people don't know is that right after Dr. Strangelove came out the Air Force fired several dozen generals for psychological reasons. Um, this is the power of the self-preventing prophecy and it, these self-preventing prophecies, these critical prophecies are extremely irksome 
to the uh, elites. But in a sane society, the elites understand that it helps them to do better statecraft and to avoid making terrible mistakes. Another source of potential inadvertent war we saw last year in Chelyabinsk in, in Russia, where a, an asteroid blew up over this town and shattered all the windows. Uh, had this happened, we now realize there were, there, there were 12 during the Cold War, 12 major megaton level such explosions on planet Earth during the Cold War, and dozens um, down at a lower level. A and any of these, had they happened at the wrong time and in the wrong place, could have uh, triggered some kind of a spasm, which is why I've uh, been talking to uh, some of our agencies. Uh, some of our civil ser servants are very smart and very sincere about wanting to avoid this sort of thing. So they're concerned not only about proliferation, but about attribution. And so a great deal of science has gone into the notion where if there is ever an explosion, that uh, if there's any kind of international law or goodwill, that the place would be swarmed with, with technicians trying to get the isotopic ratios so that they can do attribution. But of course the bad guys are now learning how to lace in isotopes to try to fake uh, attribution to, to the people that they want to see blamed for all of this. Um, the, uh, the notion that you not only have the possibility of terrorists wanting to set off an explosion in a city, and by the way, I think we're much more resilient than our leaders allowed us to be after 9-11. We could lose dozens of cities and still be a resilient people if we were well-led and well-inspired. Our parents in, the, in World War II suffered far worse. No, it's a matter of the psychology of the situation. And one of the things, reasons to set off an inadvertent war or an unintended war is the degradation of the current world powers. You get them fighting at each other and, and that can be um, uh, degrade the powers so that other powers can step in. So there's, there's a whole lot of these aspects to it. And uh, let me just conclude with one aspect and that is if you were in 1946 listening to the debates between Teller and Oppenheimer, you would guess that the saintly, scholarly Oppenheimer was right. And you would guess that the lunatic Hungarian was wrong. But in fact, the one who predicted the, the utility of nuclear weapons was, was Teller. Okay, so we're going to move on, and I want to make sure we have time to discuss all of the scenarios. Thanks for that, David. And um, I want to just hear very briefly from Tyler and Philip, and then we're going to turn over to Beatrice to tell us about the next scenario and her impressions of it. So Tyler, then Philip. Thanks. Yeah, I'll make this very brief. Um, I, I found this to be a very interesting scenario. I appreciate Jamay's uh, clarif clarifying point that his task was to come up with one that worked, that uh, resulted in the elimination of nuclear weapons. I think it's worth noting that, I mean, to me, and this is a very statistically precise analysis here, 99 times out of 100, uh, this same scenario goes horribly, horribly wrong and spirals in a totally different direction. So what I think is very interesting, given the, um, we're not here just sort of tossing up ideas, there's a, there's a vector here, and it's how to get rid of nuclear weapons. I think it's worth paying attention to what makes this go right rather than going horribly, horribly wrong. A uh, few things just to lift out, that there had been decades of communication building. Um, I think that's uh, critically important. Um, that there are vehicles for popular movements that don't just sort of dissipate. Um, and I think that's uh, pretty important because it seems to me very possible in the wake of something like this, why actually not massive political support for retaining a deterrent? Um, you know, oh, well, if it happened to us, maybe we would know who did it and we could retaliate. Um, and I think of, uh, you know, if something bad happens with the technology and then it's taken offline. Uh, I'm just hard-pressed to think of a situation when that has happened. I think of Fukushima. You've got an initial pullback from nuclear energy, but uh, long-term consequences, I don't see a renorming of the situation. So I think that's just what's worth paying attention to with this, uh, with this particular one. How about you, Philip, before we move on? So quickly, I think a, a very, you know, as I step back, I think that what we have here is um, an actual use of a weapon, um, and it causes, you know, co you know s extreme damage. And I think that um, uh, a just as likely, or one that I'm quite frankly more worried about as a variation, is the use of this by terrorists. 
Um, and so that's something that, you know, again, we have, uh, there hasn't been an accident in the last 70 years. That doesn't mean for the next 70 years we're going to be scot-free, but we do have precedents where terrorists have actually used uh, weapons. So this is something that, that we, have to, we have to guard against. Um, and so I think that this may have some um, interesting plausibility. The other real quick question is, I wonder if, for maybe it's at the end, about does actual use causing damage actually have to occur? Is this something that has to happen for us to get to where we want to be? And I'm, I'm just curious about people's reactions to that. Oops. So, Philip, before we answer that question, let's look at the next scenario because it's a, it gives us a very different way to the future that we want, a future without nuclear weapons, which is far more intentional and doesn't take us through the path of destruction that the first scenario did. So, to help us out with her analysis of that, Beatrice, we're going to come to you and uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at that. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there was a, we start off with the really depressing part, of course, uh, which is kind of uh, horrible. I mean, I just sort of want to add some comments on the first scenario. It's sort of, um, it's been 70 years since we've seen nuclear weapons used, and I think that people might have forgotten really what nuclear weapons are, uh, and obviously any use would kind of really highlight that nuclear weapons are not magic. They're not magical power tools, theoretical exercise, they're just filthy, horrible radiological bombs that devastate everything. So I think that use would definitely uh, cause a sort of a huge uh, uproar on that thing. Um, my st the second scenario is called repurposed institutions. Um, and it's quite an entertaining scenario, I think. It's, uh, it's about a global emergency management directorate, uh, some kind of international organization or group that starts out to try to combat climate change problem. It sort of starts as an emergency management uh, organization, sort of um, employs engineers, scientists, uh, it consists of governments, but also mixed with NGOs, for example, to address certain emergencies. Uh, obviously, like a lot of emergency recovery agencies already do today, they also start looking at prevention uh, and preventing things. And that sort of coupled with uh, a movement in the international community to ban nuclear weapons based on sort of the humanitarian impacts creates a, a situation where this agency also tackles nuclear dismantlement uh, of, of nuclear weapons. And I think this is a quite a interesting scenario. I mean, first of all, to me, it's as a campaigner, it's quite strange to think 30 years ahead. Uh, I don't know about you, but my sort of calendar runs until August right now, and that's it. I don't know what's going to happen after that. So thinking 30 years ahead is kind of daunting, uh, but at the same time, quite interesting. Um, what I really liked about this scenario is that it has a, a pretty good sort of, um, I like the practical uh, sort of foundation of this. Um, so it's it's really it focuses on emergency. It's sort of what happens uh, in an emergency, and, and sort of takes it from there, uh, which is something we've seen uh, in a lot of other weapons negotiations. I mean, we in ICANN focus a lot on the humanitarian impact, uh, talking to things like the International Committee of the Red Cross, for example, or uh, OCHA, or other agencies that actually would have to do the real cleanup. Uh, afterwards, and I think it's a very powerful thing. So you don't start out basing this on sort of um, uh, security interest. You actually look at the practical implications, and I think that sort of connects very well to to what we are doing in this movement on on, on banning nuclear weapons. Um, it's not so highlighted in this, but it has a section. Uh, that talks about these conferences that have taken place in, in, in the real world in Oslo, Nayarit, and, and Vienna right now, where non-nuclear non, non weapon states, for example, are sort of talking about nuclear weapons, talking about the humanitarian impact uh, of nuclear weapons and how um, that can be a basis for moving forward. Um, in ICANN, we hope that this will lead to a treaty ban in nuclear weapons. In this scenario, it has. Um, and so I think it's quite interesting to think a little bit about what kind of impact that would have on 
nuclear armed states, even if they would not participate. To us, I mean, we're convinced that, that it would have a huge impact uh, if, say, 180 countries decided to ban nuclear weapons, uh, stigmatizing them, delegitimizing them in the way that we treat biological weapons or chemical weapons, landmines or cluster munitions. It would really shift sort of the, the attitudes of people. It would devalue nuclear weapons. Um, sometimes I feel like it's a little bit like the emperor's new clothes. The terror only works if we believe in it. If we don't believe it, do they lose their value? Uh, so I think that this kind of process, if it would be this kind of agencies focused on climate change, uh, I don't know. But I think that a treaty banning nuclear weapons, for example, led by non-nuclear weapon states, setting the stigma on nuclear weapons uh, could really set the stage, not just on this scenario, but on many other scenarios in this as well, to utilize other venues for the actual practical disarmament. So I think it was, it was, it's, um, it's a pretty interesting uh, and obviously a preferable scenario uh, aside from the, the first one. So Beatrice, I'm going to, as I did with Eric, I want to ask you a couple of questions to go a little bit deeper on this and then I know uh, Jame might have some things to jump in on here as will others. Uh, so there's a there's an important um, uh, assumption behind this scenario, which is that it's possible for a transnational institution to be the main catalyst for a world free from nuclear weapons, uh, but that it would only be true if we, as you just said, we're including non-state actors as part of that transnational institution. And importantly, um, this scenario pulls out uh, the private sector, uh, institutions that have some role to play in managing global risk, like the insurance industry or the reinsurance industry. And I'm um, really curious to know what you think, uh, just understanding what you do of geopolitics, what the uh, plausibility of such a, the efficacy of such a transnational group might look like, or how eff efficacious it could be. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a part of sort of a bigger trend. Uh, I mean, I notice also that in the scenario, uh, countries like the United States, for example, or Russia are quite reluctant to this in the beginning, which I assume that they would be. Uh, but I think it's a part of a, a trend in international relations also to, first of all, work very closely with non-state actors, uh, civil society, private companies. The state is no longer the only player in this field. Uh, so I think that is quite reasonable uh, to assume that that will continue. But also this idea that you don't need everyone on board. Uh, progressive initiatives can start off smaller, maybe with a focus scope, and then can sort of um, snowball almost into taking over other issues, be, you know, have the outstanding uh, countries that stands outside joining. Uh, so I think absolutely it, it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, way of thinking and, and could happen, definitely. Okay, Jume, you okay, um, Jume. jump in here and then Tyler? Yeah, um, I just wanted to be very quick here and this actually applies both, both to this one and to the next one. <clears throat> I've done a lot of work in the realm of looking at climate change and trying to understand what kinds of global drivers we have to, to basically work against that problem. And it's important to recognize that for many people, climate change is at least as dangerous a risk, or at least as high a risk as nuclear weapons. And so it's one thing that struck me as an engine for this scenario in particular is the idea that the tools that we come up with to combat one could conceivably be used to combat the other. That there's enough of a, uh, uh, there are enough parallels, global scale, uh, necessity of, of deep structural change that that struck that struck me as being a plausible outcome. Yeah, if I can just jump in, the thing I would add to this again, and what's the difference maker in this scenario that it goes well instead of poorly, and uh, in terms of where, especially N Square might invest, uh, other people might invest. What I think is really fascinating about this one is the development of a new type of institution, uh, a, a really a new a new paradigm and a new phenomenon that engages uh, beyond. Um, sort of the strict boundaries of political borders. So I, I think that's, that's what we can see playing out in a hopeful way here. And it, that, that seemed to me that this takes this in a much more positive direction overall than, say, the next one, which is uh, maybe dealing with similar themes, but um, overall has, a, has quite a lot more damage associated with it. 
So yeah, I have a real quick comment. Another observation that I think um, is highlighted here but really pertains to all the other scenarios is the notion that one sector can't do it all. And what I liked about this one was that the private sector and industry was heavily involved in this. And if we're talking about wicked problems, it is really the notion that solving global problems like this is not the realm of governments, it's not the realm of um, uh, civil society. Uh, it is everybody working together uh, because of complexity, um, and I think this particular uh, scenario highlighted that. Uh, if, I, if I may here, um, the, sure. what we're talking about to some extent is the emergence of what we've never had on planet Earth, and that's some kind of world government. Now you say that, those two words, to an American, and it raises hackles even among the liberals even among um, Democrats. And one of the reasons is because we're citizens of this periods, this century's Pax Imperium. Now, throughout the past, either you had a Pax or you didn't. If you had a Pax, the likelihood is that your city would never burn and you could raise your kids and do business your entire life merely having to suffer oppression but not having your city burned and, 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 and everybody raped and killed. Uh, the disadvantage of a PAX is that it sometimes slows down progress and it's sometimes hugely oppressive. The PAX Americana has inarguably made terrible mistakes, but it's also been inarguably the best thing ever that has ever happened on this planet. And that is because, uh, except for the United States, the Soviet Union, Russia, and a couple of other places, the fraction of GNP that most nations on Earth have spent on arms plummeted from a typical historical value of 50% down to 2% in most countries around the world, allowing fantastic rates of development. Now, I'm not defending Pax Americana. It's a transition, but it is the first Pax that has wanted not to be an empire. So the question you raise with Americans is not world government. What you say instead is WCN. Whatever comes next. Do you think Pax Americana is going to last for a million years? A thousand? Even a hundred? Most Americans would nod and say, okay, 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 something's going to happen next. Then <coughs> get involved in the design. If Americans are involved in the design, then it's likely to be something loose, respectful of diversity, difference, and, 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 and all of that. So that's what I urge my fellow citizens to do when it comes to WCN, is contemplate getting involved in the design instead of obstructing it. And what's happening is world government is taking shape, but it's taking shape in exactly the wrong way. Every year, the international bureaucracy, the civil service, the institutions like the uh, trade networks and things like that, and the international courts for dispute resolution become stronger. But there is no movement towards an executive branch and a legislative branch. Why? Because those are the branches that the people can have a say in. And the number one thing about this development of world government by oligarchy is leave out the parts that a world, the world citizenry might say, we have say in that. And when it comes to the courts, there is no standing for individuals in the international courts. It's only nations and major corporations, and they want to keep it that way. Okay, so I, I have to say that I now know that it's possible to feel people raising their eyebrows through the internet, because uh, I could feel it happening. And um, I also know that Eric, because I'm telepathic, Eric has, uh, is going to have the last word on this. And then we're going to come back to you, David, to take us in a different direction with the next scenario. I think some people in the world might not have as rosy a view of what Pax Americana has brought them. And I think that when you look at Pax Americana, it is essentially an empire, the greatest military empire, largest, most powerful military empire the world has ever seen. But I'd, I'd agree with Churchill that it's been the worst empire ever except for all the others. And when it comes to world government and civil society, um, I think that civil society and non-governmental uh, 
uh, organizations have a huge and central role to play in bringing about a world without nuclear weapons. But in some way, we have uh, world government already. I mean, when you think about the fact that Apple's annual revenues are larger now, perhaps in Saudi Arabia's, we have enormous multinational corporations that have tremendous power throughout the world, for better or for worse. Uh, they could probably play a role in bringing a world without nuclear weapons because um, a nuclear exchange is not going to be very good for any of their bottom line, uh, ultimately. So I just wanted to, to throw in those thoughts about world government and Pax Americana. That's great. I thought you might. So here's what we're going to do. A couple of things are happening. One is that we've gotten some interesting comments from folks who are watching this um, episode, uh, including some votes about which of these scenarios might be most plausible in their view, which is great. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I want to make sure that people know if you're watching this, you want to send us your ideas. You may have a scenario in your head or you may think we've missed something. Let us know that. Um, so now, if you were looking at these scenarios on a map, let's assume for a moment we were in the southwest quadrant of our map. Now we're going up to the northeast. We're going to look at a scenario that's quite different in nature from this last one in the sense that this is about the dominance of other bigger problems. Uh, and and uh, David Brin is going to help us out with that. Hey, David, okay. you're, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, we have bigger problems, and, and in my line of work, you know, in, in for instance, in my novels Earth and Existence, I, I talk about bigger problems distracting us from, from our, um, from what, from what's uh, our, our current obsessions, and there is, there is long in science fiction been the notion that if we had an external threat, that it would cause a coalescence into WCN, into some form of world government, or at least the uh, elimination of um, current tensions. Um, the great science fiction author from China, Liu Cixin, that's C-I-X-I-N, this year his, the first volume of his Three Body Problem series um, has, has come out, and it's the greatest science fiction to come out of Asia in many, many years and it portrays this happening. We're going, it doesn't have to be an alien threat, although a lot of sci-fi portrays this, um, an alien threat being concocted in order to drive us together. Um, it can, of course, as the image on the screen indicates, be global climate change, a flood of world refugees. Uh, this will either cause um, tumbrils rolling in the streets filled with oligarchs who blocked um, you know, fix this to climate change, or it could result in uh, tyranny, or if the technology for reciprocal surveillance, surveillance being looking back at authority, as Erica was talking about earlier, if these technologies prevent tyranny, then it could result in the creation uh, or the engendering of a worldwide citizenry um, that demands that our leadership um, change its direction in some of these things. And I think that's how we'll get rid of the bomb. Uh, I think that um, what may happen is people may recognize that a certain basic level of deterrence helped to keep the peace for all these years, and so maybe three or four or five nations are licensed to be the caretakers of a basic set of nukes, if for no other reason, then they would uh, also be useful in diverting asteroids. Um, so having, having this um, sort of caretaker position uh, be a uh, licensed, supervised, reciprocally inspected and accountable, um, it, it may be that we would not eliminate all of them, but the only possibility for getting to that point is if we can deal with proliferation. And as technology advances, proliferation will go farther and farther down the scale until you get into terrorist networks. And that means that we need to make progress on human sanity, on eliminating poverty, 
Um, and we are making progress in those areas. It's just that the, that that kind of progress has to accelerate um, in tandem with the development of our world institutions. And it may be that other problems will drive this. Oh, okay, so let me ask a question. This time I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, send this in the direction of Rachel Pike. Um, so Rachel, this is a scenario uh, that talks about a moment of clarity being possible. And maybe I should put it this way, that a moment of clarity is sufficient to get global behavior to change about nuclear weapons. Uh, so there are a lot of other things that the scenario is about, but this is one of the key drivers, that it's possible in the way that Jamey has said to us uh, that, that the self-help community thinks about individuals can reach a moment of clarity, and that's sufficient to get them to, or maybe an important uh, precedent for them to be able to change their behavior. Is that true in a geopolitical sense? Uh, so, Rachel. Sure. I mean, I think in this scenario, two things precede that moment of clarity that are interesting to pull out. Um, the first is the um, climate change disaster, which effectively acts here as the creation of a common enemy among here, uh, nation states, but I think even in the other scenario that we just discussed, it could be among non-state actors too. Um, but the creation of the common enemy is an interesting point of collaboration between the two. Um, and it doesn't go through specifically how that creates communication between different nation states, but um, I think the moment that's most interesting here is when Pakistan unilaterally raises its hand and said, someone else take care of our nukes, we have other problems that are bigger. Well, how does Pakistan have that relationship with China? And how do we start creating relationship with nation states where a unilateral decision can not only happen within the boundaries of that country, um, but can also be supported by other countries around the world? And to me, that is the most interesting thing this scenario hinges on that then sort of cascades into this moment of clarity that you're talking about. Yeah, so... I mean, I think this is quite an interesting um, scenario, um, and I think that what I what I like about it the most is this sort of no drama around the dismantlement, and this this no sort of I think that could actually be quite likely. I mean, the the climate change. I mean, obviously, climate change um, is is a huge issue, and I think it's, it's becoming more and more evident today that the the big security threats we are facing cannot be fought by nuclear, with nuclear weapons. We can't save ourselves from climate change with nuclear weapons. We can't stop the Syrian civil war with, with nuclear weapons. We can't uh, fight ISIS with nuclear weapons. Um, I think that the, um, I mean, of course, the climate change impact here is very radical and dramatic, but I think even without that kind of drama on, on the climate change side, it, we can still see that just nuclear weapons are not prioritized anymore. Uh, and it's just not, it just not, does not make sense to spend that much money on, on, on these weapons and, and sort of slowly, there might never be this big ceremony where the UK and US and Russia all sign their treaties and, and finally let go. It's just that suddenly, nah, we have other things to do. So I think that's quite a, quite a interesting. I think that, you know, one of the challenges for us today, I mean, because I think it's really important to keep thinking about how this impacts us today is to think of what can we do to put those these things in place? What can we do to to uh, make sure that nuclear weapons are deprioritized uh, and are sort of less valued and, and, and those kind of things. So I think it's a very it's a very um, interesting uh, scenario and and I quite like the idea of suddenly just nuclear weapons being not particularly useful. So I guess let's take this in a different direction altogether now. So if this last scenario was important, uh, where it was important for there to be real change and self-reflection on the geopolitical scene, on the global scene, uh, what if that's not true? Uh, what if instead just the nature of the weaponry changes, uh, but in fact uh, the politics and behavior of con around conflict management doesn't change so much as the tools that we use. Uh, so to talk about sticks and stones, we're, we're going to go to Rachel Pike. Sure. This was a fascinating scenario to read um, sitting here in Silicon Valley. So it basically looks at a world where um, China has developed very large, very effective spears, uh, which come down from tungsten spears, which come down from space, which are very accurate and don't have much fallout. 
um, and the U.S. develops um, weapons that can, I think of them as slingshot, but wrangle asteroids to a specific place on Earth. And uh, what I think is interesting about this scenario is that at its core, it asks a question of, can innovation be more detrimental than helpful, which is a question that people sort of ask Silicon Valley as a place all the time, and therefore do we want to stifle innovation in any way? Um, but it does in this scenario. We do end up with weapons that do not have the same types of risks that we have been looking at at the last 70 years, and is that benefit worth what we sort of trade off for it, which is that we still end up in a world where the, the concept and the strategy of deterrence remains the main military focus of these types of high-impact weapons. And to me, that's, that's the interesting question here. Would you ever want to change the process or cycle of innovation? Could you even ever do it, is another question here. Um, and what is it that we're really trying to get rid of in this conversation? Are we trying to get rid of a certain set of metal tubes and screws and a certain type of fuel, or are we trying to get away from the mentality of deterrence, um, of a certain type of military action that takes place between um, states and the way that they have conversations? Um, and to me, that's the core of this that's so interesting. Jume, you have some thoughts about that? Well, this is a, uh, for me, this is a, a very interesting scenario because I really wanted to grapple with the idea that nuclear weapons are not necessarily the ultimate weapon. And, you know, what does the world look like if nuclear weapons go away, not because we've all become uh, the angels of our better nature, but because we've come up with something that fulfills our needs better. Um, and these are not, these are not happy devices. I mean, as it, the scenario describes, you have, on, on one side, you have bolts from the blue orbiting over our heads at all time, and on the other side, you have the exact same mechanism that, that caused the great extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, and yet, in this scenario, it's painfully plausible. It, if, if I may... Um, the uh, problem with new weapons is that it resurrects the great danger that was discussed by Herman Kahn and Edward Teller and some of the others uh, when they were the models for Dr. Strangelove, and that's the delusion of winnability. Um, somehow we got across the 1950s uh, and especially the Reagan era when some were talking about the possible winnability of nuclear war. And the uh, professionalism of the military cast in that horrible Pax Americana, and by the way, I don't disagree with anything you said, Eric. Uh, you, you, you actually typified it very, very cleverly. Uh, I, I consider Pax Americana to be defendable only because it's, it's, it's less bad and had some good side effects. The military cast in the United States overruled Reagan and overruled the, the earlier people because they said, our calculations show that these weapons are deterrents, but they do not have a win scenario. If we develop new sticks and stones that are more precise, then the danger is that it can create the notion of the delusion of potential winning. And this is what we see with drones right now. And I don't, uh, you know, as you can guess, I'm probably the most, uh, because I'm contrarian to you all, uh, I'm probably in this phase of my life, this, this, this hour, the most Edward Teller-like and the most Dr. Strangelove guy here on this panel. And, 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 and I don't mind some of the uses of, of drones today, but it scares me that we could be heading down the path where uh, we would be developing weapons um, that create, once again, this delusion that truly substantial confrontational uh, war is winnable. Eric? You know, I, I think that technological advance may threaten uh, the future of nuclear weapons in the sense that our military today is remarkably anti-nuclear. I know that there's a great deal of debate right now about a modernization of our arsenal that will cost a trillion dollars, but I get the sense that in their hearts our military doesn't really want to spend that money 
and would much rather spend the money on conventional weapons that might be able to be used. Um, and I can imagine new technologies that, if not operating perfectly like Star Wars to eliminate the ability to launch a, a nuclear strike, might serve as a deterrent without relying on nuclear weapons. I mean, when you think about the deterrence that nuclear weapons provides, it's essentially holding the women and children and civilians of your adversary hostage and threatening to annihilate all of them in order to prevent a conflict. And there might be other more precise conventional weapons, i.e. Uh, holding the leadership of your adversary uh, at great risk that might obviate the need for nuclear weapons. And, and I don't know, you know, when, when Beatrice talked about what these weapons actually do, nuclear weapons actually do, and their consequences, there must be other ways to preserve the peace without, hap without threatening to destroy the world and without threatening to, just to kill millions of innocent civilians. If you'd like uh, one scenario that would work, it's that take all the world's leaders and put a torque or, a, or an explosive bracelet or something around all of their necks, and uh, then, it's, then it's in their interest. Um, so uh, I, I, would, would, I would vote for that. Of course, most of the world's people would. Um, the question is, can we get to the point where um, the good trends in the world, and these are discussed in Steven Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature, the decline in general per capita violence around the world, um, which we're distracted from by focusing on the, on the places in the world where it's not declining, where it's terrible, but that is the methodology by which violence has gone down, is the fact that our attention goes to the places that, that tug at our hearts, that tug at our conscience. Uh, if we can keep these phenomena rolling, not only out of the goodness of our hearts, but out of pragmatism for the sake of our grandchildren, then these trends might bring us to the point where there is an active world citizenry that says if you want power and wealth, you have to get this thing around your neck. Rachel and Philip, yeah, jump in. Go ahead. Sure, just one more thing on this particular scenario, which I think is interesting. It talks specifically about reducing the risk of fallout by increasing precision through innovation and technology. Um, what it doesn't talk about, it sort of posits that risk is reduced in the ability for having an accident with this type of weaponry. And I find that to be not only implausible, just because you've upgraded and innovated on your weapons, um, but that that would require a whole different set of processes inside the walls of these, or of these organizations, of these governments that we talk about. So what is changing inside the United States military that means that just because we can slingshot an asteroid with precision, that the person who's pressing the red button and holding the codes is in a different place than they are today? Um, and I thought this scenario sort of elevated that risk actually even more um, and sort of eliminated one and then increased the other. It was just an interesting point for me as I read it. Ella? Yeah, I found, I found this one extraordinarily depressing in, in many respects as well. Um, and again, it seems to me like a race, if I had to say, if something is going to happen between the first scenario and this one. Uh, you know, I, I just keep on thinking about uh, countries and society. It's always a race for the better technology. I mean, that's just inherent um, in the way we go about doing things. And um, I just felt, again, as I, as I thought about this, uh, I, I think this is a lot more plausible. I just underscore Jame was talking about than, than people realize in certain effect, whether it's specifically the spears or not, I, I don't know, but something else is going to come about. And um, again, this is what I underscored about this whole notion of uh, the goal that we're talking about here is not necessarily utopian. I mean, we have a lot of other scenarios here um, in certain ways of a, of a very different world because the circumstances and conditions have changed. Um, so anyway, that's just sort of a, a quick observation that I had when I read this. It's interesting that you uh, raise the question in this last exchange of, of 
human factors, really the, uh, the fact that all of this, even if we are in a race for new technologies that could replace the technologies we have right now for mass destruction, are going to come down to the capacity of human beings to do the right thing or even to know that they have the information they need to do what they believe is right under very, very stressful circumstances. We had conversations earlier in this series with um, a neuroscientist who talked about the importance of really focusing on decision making and what we know about human beings under stress. And uh, it feels to me like you all have pointed to a strand that we need to remember to come back to. And in fact, is a reasonably good uh, segue actually into the last scenario, which uh, Jaime describes as uh, describes as being the end of the nuclear era that happens not with a bang, uh, fortunately, as he says, or a whimper, but with a yawn. Uh, it's really about diplomatic efforts paying off. It's about uh, the work of human beings over time, patiently continuing to uh, do the work together uh, of nuclear, ending the nuclear era. Uh, so to talk about that, uh, we have Tyler, and then I, we want to make sure that we have time at the end of all of this to talk about what we've learned from looking across this whole set of five uh, very different versions of the future. So Tyler. Thanks. Um, so I'll just briefly summarize uh, this scenario, which I, I found extremely interesting. Uh, others can, can read it online. Um, this is the virtual zero or gradual disarmament scenario. In some ways, it's the least exciting of the scenarios, and therefore maybe the one we all ought to hope for the most. Um, uh, as roughly outlined, it's gradual process and multilateral disarmament, a uh, few periodic gains, um, focus mostly on threat reduction, some concrete kind of low, uh, uh, low horizon uh, goals. Um, that, uh, that that work and don't work. Um, meanwhile, at the same time, there's progress in bilateral relations. And the way this scenario plays out is that there's an India-Pakistan breakthrough. And what that does is it sort of sets the stage for uh, involvement of other actors to, to take similar steps toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. So um, that's kind of the catalyzing thing that pushes this from being uh, a scenario where, um, you know, there's, there's just some limited gains to something that could be uh, the complete elimination of nuclear weapons, or, or as, it, as it seems, because it ends with the idea of a virtual arsenal, which is we will have a virtual arsenal um, that is ready to be reassembled if the knowledge is applied in a certain way. It's a matter of how we manage the technology. Um, a brief critical engagement with this to open up the conversation. Why I thought this worked. Um, I thought that one of the interesting things about this, uh, this scenario was, for example, the 2024 uh, No First Use Declaration in, in the NPT Preparatory Committee. Um, that seems about right. Ten years for a pretty modest gain in the NPT. That's sort of the timeline along which nuclear diplomacy often works. Uh, so that, 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 could be, that could be plausible. Uh, I, I like the fact that it ends in virtual arsenals, not because I like virtual arsenals, but because I find them realistic, and I think that that's um, that's something that kind of takes the the boogeyman out of a way, out of the way of somebody might cheat. Um, just remembering, well, there is the possibility of reconstituting. Um, but what I think is interesting about this is that you have the situation of almost zero uh, leading to actual whoa. Um, the thing that I'd permit that are going to uh, contextualize and and, um, and pressure us to move in this direction. Where's places I found this less plausible? Um, unfortunately, as we're seeing with the U.S. and Russia right now, practical threat reduction is hostage to non-nuclear strategic politics. So you've got a situation unfolding in Ukraine, uh, declining U.S.-Russian relationships, and as a result, uh, really common sense nobody can argue with them, cooperative threat reduction programs are being shelved because the two countries can't play nicely together and recognize a common interest. Um, that's all too common and I think would be a place where maybe this falls apart. Um, the India-Pakistan disarmament scenario, what this brought up for me is I see it unlikely anything bilaterally happening with India and Pakistan because India's primary adversary is actually China. Um, so India has nuclear weapons be primarily because of China Pakistan has nuclear weapons because of India, and, it's, and this, this brings up a, a bigger theme, that nuclear weapons are, in fact, a great leveler. So you have countries of varying degrees of power 
and nuclear weapons sort of pushes them into a frame where they become adversaries. And I think this points out the necessity of working comprehensively at the categorical level of nuclear possessor versus non-nuclear possessor. So the idea of sort of a small group of nuclear countries giving up their power uh, while others keep it strikes me as highly unlikely. Uh, I think it ultimately devolves. Each country can sort of punt responsibility uh, up the line to the U.S. and Russia. Uh, and so I think anything uh, that we anything positive is going to have to have a more whole cloth approach. Uh, one last thing: um, there are at present two primary, in my identification, mean, this is purely my analysis, but two primary diplomatic threads at play working toward uh, ostensibly the elimination of nuclear weapons. One of them would be the NPT process, which is the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty process, which is governed by. Um, the, the great powers of the world, the, the permanent representatives of the Security Council. Um, we need to gradually preserve um, humanitarian impact, um, uh, ably represented here by, by Beatrice, who's, who's really at the forefront of this um, uh, movement toward a legal ban. Not that w that would uh, and forcibly eliminate nuclear weapons, but that would renorm uh, the weapons so that they're not sort of an acceptable uh, evil that we gradually work to eliminate, but something along the lines of conventional and bio, or, uh, chemical and bio weapons um, that then has to be dealt with in, in a different way. Um, and I would want to see. I, I think if we if, if we think about the gradual progress of, of disarmament politics and disarmament diplomacy. Um, there's an opportunity cost here, and, and you have to decide which way you're going to go. And I think it's important that people encountering this scenario know that you know we're not just inventing something out of nothing. We're starting here with 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 something that has two trajectories, each of which has political forces behind it, and people are going to have to decide about that. So I'm this represents kind of the triumph of the gradual NPT process, and I have to admit I'm I'm pretty bearish about that prospect. With that, let me open it up. Beatrice. Beatrice. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to me, I mean, quite sort of maybe entertainingly, this seems like the most least possible scenario in a way. Um, it's very much uh, describing sort of the current preferred um, way forward by those states with nuclear weapons. And the, the problem that I have mostly with this is the kind of how we get to elimination of nuclear weapons by continuing focusing on deterrence and, and, and valuing nuclear weapons. It's just sort of, um, I don't know if you, for those of you who went to the Vienna conference, I know Tyler was there and, and Eric and Eric was, were there, um, there was this stunt, someone trying to stand on a box and try to eliminate the box at the same time. It's not really possible. You cannot continue saying nuclear weapons are really essential for my security so I'm going to get rid of them. Why would you get rid of them? So I see this kind of reductions um, at the same time as you continue believing in the terrorists, we continue believing that these are useful weapons, seems to me a bit difficult to do at the same time. So for me, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously I, I, I work on this on an international treaty process, so I, I put very much value into that and thinking that that can work, these negotiations can work, but you kind of have to start with something different, I think. For me, a just sort of um, hoping that governments uh, would like to reduce the number one way isn't going to happen. You have to sort of first agree that this doesn't work, we don't want these weapons, and then reductions can take place. So just to jump in here a little bit, I wanted to clarify that with the uh, with this scenario, <clears throat> it is a, an interesting one in that it does, as you know, as Beatrice you know, points out, it it does con continue to have a deterrence-based structure. This is not a scenario where we have changed the culture. It's a scenario where we have gotten rid of a particular tool, and in that way, it's actually very close to the fourth scenario, in that it's also one where the 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 Politics and the culture don't really change that much because you still have an emphasis on um, the uncertainty that's at the core of deterrence. So it's actually that's something that hasn't been brought up yet, but it's really important to, to call out is that deterrence is based not just on threat but on uncertainty. 
you know, I can't, you know, as a, you know, as a state, I can't be certain that this, you know, the other state won't be able to retaliate. I can't be certain that I'll be safe. So I can't do this bad thing because I can't be certain that I'll, it'll happen without a problem. And so that continued uncertainty actually exists even without the obvious maintenance of a visible arsenal, at least in this scenario. And in the conversations I've had with a variety of other specialists in this field, it actually struck them as being surprisingly plausible. And you know, I'm not going to try to argue that any one of these is more plausible than the other. And I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. But um, this one, I think you need to really focus on how that, what happens when you have continued uncertainty, even without the continued presence of the weapons. Um, if I may, <clears throat> our most dangerous period was um, under Eisenhower Kennedy when uh, there was great uncertainty. Uh, now, I agree with, with what you just said, Jamais, but I'm going to shine light on the obverse of that. Um, Dwight Eisenhower, in many ways, was one of our wisest presidents, and he knew from his experience as a military officer that wars start when, uh, when delusional men uh, miscalculate the other side's capabilities and intentions. And he sent the U-2 planes over Russia because they could see what we were, what we had, but we could not see what they had. And therefore, the CIA was bumping up estimates of Soviet capabilities, and we were driving the arms race because of our own fear. Once we got not just communication satellites, but above all, the thing that saved all our lives was the spy satellites. And now they are proliferating. Uh, they, they calmed everything down because each side could see what the other had. Now you can get a spy satellite image of your own neighborhood or some other neighborhood for a hundred bucks. As this develops, again, you start heading into the area where lies can be refuted in real time. And that's when you start getting the hope for a world citizenry that is active and vigorous. If I may point out, you know, I'm one, the only one here who remembers being sent under the desk uh, during the heydays of the 50s. Oh, jamais, you look very young. <laughs> um, and, and the real terror that it could happen any moment on the horizon, and that's it. And this was expressed in my novel, The Postman, which got Kevin Costnerized. This expressed my trauma about this. So my sense of passion about wanting a better future that's filled with peace and hope is no less than any of yours. I have a somewhat contrarian, um, real politic, Dr. Strangelove-ish take on it. But in the long run, if we're going to keep relying on deterrence with spasm weapons that kill millions of women and children, no, no, this, <laughs> we're in agreement about the goal. It's just, uh, I don't want to totally eliminate the things we may need against asteroids. Okay, I'm going to give the last comment here to Philip, and then I'm going to ask every one of you to go around just as we finish up this, um, this episode. I'm going to ask you each to think about, out loud, uh, think about which of these scenarios uh, feels most plausible to you, or which elements from the scenarios do you see being most important for us to think about, um, and or uh, what ideas uh, have come up for you as we've done this exercise here today. Uh, so let me fin uh, finish up here first with Philip, and then I'll come around to the room with all so of you. So this last scenario, is, I just want to kind of again emphasize as I. This is the block and tackle right now what the nonproliferation community is doing right now. Um, it is longer term. Um, it's the notion that, you know, with a certain amount of time and a goal to move forward on a, on a rules-based sort of uh, framework, you can actually accomplish something. And I think that if <clears throat> you look over time, um, that has worn out, has been worn out, but you've got all these wild card scenarios that come through that may actually impede or take you in a different direction. So one of the pleas that I make, especially for the people who are out there looking, is that this needs supplementing. 
Um, and I think in certain regard, this is really part of the point of what we're doing here with this whole series, is to try to get some new ideas and new people here to supplement some of the hard block and tackle work that we're doing right now, but somehow augments it and makes it greater, um, that the whole is somehow greater than the sum of its parts. And so that's one of the pleads that I would make to, to people who are viewing. Okay, so with that, I can't believe it, but it feels like, uh, and it really has gone very quickly, at least for me, uh, we're getting close to the end of this episode. So I'd like to come around. I'm going to start with you, Beatrice. I'll come uh, very briefly to each of you. Beatrice, then David, and then Jamey, and then Rachel and Tyler, and ask you for your closing thoughts, ideas. Uh, go, Beatrice. Thank you, Erica. Um, yeah, I mean, very interesting. I mean, I think that there's some things that reason very well in, in all scenarios and some that we might feel a little bit more far stretch. Uh, and probably uh, the real way we're going to eliminate nuclear weapons might very well be a merge of all five. Um, but for me, it's sort of, it's important to keep focusing on now. Uh, nobody will know, knows what will happen. Nobody has the solution. We've never eliminated nuclear weapons before, so we don't know what, how to do it. What we just have to do is, is thinking right now, how can we set the conditions uh, for moving forward? How can, what can we do now in order to speed this up? Um, I would like to actually encourage people not to focus too much on uh, 2045. Uh, I think it's quite disempowering, especially if we're trying to raise awareness and encourage a new generation to talk about this issue, uh, to think so far ahead. Uh, who wants to join a cause that we aren't going to win until 30 years soon? You know, not me. I'll do something that matters now, uh, in a way. So I think we need to sort of break it down. It's maybe not about zero all the time. We need to break it down into smaller pieces. Um, obviously, for us, I mean, I can. We focus on a ban treaty. I mean, we think we can have that in place within two years. It's a tangible thing. It will change the dynamics. It will set a stage for any of these different scenarios to be more, to be more effective um, if we also have prohibited nuclear weapons. Um, and I'm pretty, I mean, I think that there are different scenarios. I mean, we, we all probably agree that the first one, while unlikely, is the one we would li really like to avoid. Um, I really need believe that nuclear weapons will be prohibited. Uh, the question is, will we prohibit them before or after they have been used? Uh, and I think that right now we have a, a choice. We can actually choose to do that before. Uh, so we should. All right. Let's have out All David. Right. And have David and we'll go to Rachel. I'm changing things up because we're a little short on time here. David? Yeah, well, uh, 2045 is actually not the far distant future for me. It's where I set my, my nearest uh, time frame novel called Existence and therein I discuss a number of the issues that I think are part and parcel of this and one is uh, whether or not we slump back into a pyramidal social structure or as I've spoken of here we build a world diamond shaped social structure in which a vast um, fluid churning and creatively competitive middle class is unafraid of the oligarchs and outnumbers the poor. If we have that empowered by technology, then I believe that many of these problems will to some extent be put under control simply by the fact that an empowered world citizenry um, will demand it. And, and that is how I think that plowshares will happen, Rachel. This is how I think that people will, um, and the evangelicals, Tyler, will play a role in this uh, as long as they de-emphasize the book in the canon that um, Martin Luther despised and that got voted into the canon by one vote, uh, and that one vote was a sun-worshipping heretic. So I think that as long as you guys are devaluing the one that relishes the coming of nuclear war, then you're welcome at the table as well. Um, and so that's, you know, that's where I stand on this. I think that it's important that we build a world citizenry, and then that citizenry will demand WCN, whatever comes next. 
and that WCN will then find a way to de-emphasize nuclear weapons. Let's see, Erica, you asked us what we are going to go home thinking about, and the two scenarios that are going to stick with me just in terms of can't get them out of my head are the third and the fourth, one which sort of posits a world of distraction uh, where nuclear weapons fall to the background and kind of become dismantled without any fanfare, uh, and, the, and the fourth innovation. And the two, they strike me for two reasons. One, because they're sort of outside, as Philip said, outside how the nonproliferation community thinks about things today, and I think that's why they'll stick. But the second is that if we really do think about them as realistic scenarios, what does the nonprolif what can and what should the nonproliferation community do to actually enable those? Um, you know, not that we want the most cataclysmic climate change scenario to become the you know, um, event that distracts us. But I do think it's interesting to think about how do you engage in something completely different um, from diplomacy and sort of block and tackle negotiation. And that's the thing I'm going to think about tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Um, so two closing thoughts uh, based on where investment uh, and innovation ought to go from here. Um, one thing that strikes me from all the scenarios is the role that norms play, uh, global norms, um, more uh, domestic political norms. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that events don't happen and that events happen in the context of norms. And so a disaster uh, happening with a nuclear weapon uh, is very different if there's been 15 years of a uh, global ban treaty movement preceding it. Um, people interpret things differently, and I think that's important. So I think uh, investing in efforts that change norms on a macro level are pretty important. Uh, the second thing I'd noticed that I found uh, underdeveloped in the scenarios, it's not a criticism per se of them, but a place where I see your investment, is as the global order becomes more and more commercialized, or as uh, commercial interests uh, gain more, more of a relative portion of influence vis-a-vis -vis purely political entities, I think business actors are going to be crucially important and saying simply that nuclear weapons as an instrument of a bygone global order and a bygone structure of a global order um, are really bad. Uh, and finding way to leverage the business community um, who's client with really is far advanced of what we deal with diplomatically, finding ways to leverage and invest in that community is, is, uh, is of paramount importance. I'll leave it at that, and I really appreciate uh, being invited to this conversation. Philip? So, what strikes me about all these, and I think compliment Jame on this, I mean, as we've heard all this, I, I kind of feel like this is almost like a race. Um, all these scenarios have plausibility in certain ways, and it's going to be um, interesting. Some things are in our control, and some things are not. And so as I look at it as a practical matter, you know, what, are, what is in our control right now that we can do going on what Beatrice was talking about? So that's something that I will take with me um, in thinking about all these scenarios, understanding that all of them could happen, um, but then what is within my control in order to move this? And again, I just want to underscore the notion of what Tyler was talking about, which is, again, his notion of really talking about the private sector here and other new players. Um, I think if we're going to succeed in this and making a future that we all want, um, it's going to require uh, everybody, and I think this is really the new challenge for the new philanthropy or whatever you call it, is the space in which governments, civil society, private sector, and corporations all sort of figure out a way to work together. It'll be interesting to see where this all goes. I just want to say that, that it's been a real honor to work on these scenarios, and I want to thank Erica in particular for asking me to, to be part of this. Um, the one thing that we have to remember when we think about scenarios is that they are, they're not predictions of the future. What they do is they help to un, unfurl a map so that we have a better sense of where we're going and what obstacles may be ahead of us. The, we don't like, it's not a good idea to be surprised by the future. It's really helpful to think about what if, what if this happens, what if something occurs, what if something doesn't happen, and to think through how would we respond. Not be just reactive to everything, but think through let's actually plan. Let's make, you know, make plans for different possibilities. And not everything can happen overnight. Not everything is 
it should be done overnight. Let's think about the future. Let's think about what our choices may be. And finally, uh, Eric, um, I want to ask you, you know, there's been a lot here. This has been a very meaty conversation. I'm just curious to know how you'll be summarizing all of this for yourself and what you'd like us to be thinking about walking away. I think these five uh, scenarios were a terrific way to provoke thought. And simply by having five scenarios of the future, you have a sense that catastrophe is not inevitable and that there are different ways to avoid it. One of the things that concerns me most right now in the Western industrialized world is that I think most people are sleepwalking and there's so little awareness of this grave danger. Uh, the best-selling book that came out not long after Hiroshima in the United States that called for a world without nuclear weapons was, the title was, One World or None. And I think that's still true. Uh, I want to I want to end by bringing up a word that you don't hear in polite company very much anymore, but I think may be relevant, and that is dialectic, uh, not in the Marxist sense, but in a way that contradictions can lead to a synthesis and a better outcome. Right now, when you look in the world, you see a rise of all these ancient blood feuds and hatreds and the deliberate targeting of civilian uh, and slaughter and and all of those things might suggest that uh, the use of nuclear weapons is coming. And yet perhaps the blood, uh, the, the blood feuds in the world right now and the extraordinary violence is going, to lead through, is going to lead people throughout the world to turn away from it. And part of turning away from that sort of bloodshed is going to be getting rid of nuclear weapons. So I am optimistic. I don't think that we're doomed, but I think we really have to think carefully and uh, alert people to this danger. So thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. It's been our honor and um, I have to say it's been our honor for the last few months to have now dozens of people like you who've been here with us today on the panel helping us to look at uh, under every rock uh, for ideas and ways to think about this challenge. Um, and so I'd like to say first of all thank you to Reinventors Network, thank you for everybody here today and uh, I'll just say that in coming into this work, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with my then six-year-old who once said to me, um, Mom, why is it, uh, who created all the words and the people? And I said, well, I don't know, who do you think? And he said, well, that must have been God. And I said, okay, well, what happened before that? And he said, well, it must have been all because of God's dad, I mean his mom. And then I said, okay, well, what came before that? And he said, well, that was when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And what was before that? Well, the molecule. That was before the dinosaurs. And before all of that, I asked him, and he said, oh, that's really easy. Before all of that, all there was was the future. So for all of those kids who've got it figured out uh, and are waiting for all of us to figure it out, I um, want to say thank you to them, thank you to all of you, and again, Pete, thanks for making this happen. Couldn't say it better. It was an awesome roundtable, as it said, and it was an awesome series. And thanks to everyone, and uh, thank you all for showing up here. <laughs>